Welcome to Speaking Our Peace. My name is Annie Luck. In today's episode, we share with you a conversation I had with Julie Christensen in Iraqi Takabazi back in mid-December. At the time of our conversation, both Julie and Iraqi were in Tbilisi, Georgia. Julie is a retired professor from George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, specialized in Russian language and literature. Iraqi is the chair of the Mohammed Gandhi Foundation in Georgia. In this episode, Julie and Iraqi talk about how they met back in the 1990s at George Mason University and how they are now collaborating on a television program called War and Peace Times in Georgia, which has the objective to elevate the discussion of peace in this challenging time in the South Caucasus. All right, so let's start with, you know, Julie Iraqi someone from the U.S., someone from Georgia. How the two of you came together? <laughs> you will. Uh, I'll start and you can fix, you can correct me if I'm wrong, okay. So uh, uh, I, uh, well, I'm the oldest person here. Um, you know, I was in university between 1967 and 1970. Uh, and uh, I have to say that two of the three years that I was finishing up, we closed the university because of uh, Kent State and because of the bombing of Cambodia. And uh, we were during the 60s, just very, very focused on trying to stop that war. Um, and also there was a civil rights movement and there were so many assassinations and Martin Luther King, you know, and Bobby Kennedy. And so I was always interested in international relations. Then I went in university, I ended up in Russian and so I, majored in Russian uh, and then went to Berkeley to graduate school. And so, you know, we were always de dedicated to this. Well, then I was sort of on the road for many years, but then I, uh, my first job that lasted more than like three years was at George Mason University. <clears throat> and uh, I was in the Department of Modern Classical Languages, but uh, I had pretty good relationships already with the uh, conflict analysis and resolution at the time it was called the Institute of Conflict Analysis and Resolution, ICAR. Um, and that's really where we met Iraqi, I think. I mean, you know, we, he came in 1991, I think. And uh, uh, we worked on some pro big projects together and, uh, uh, you know, had a lot in common. And I knew his mom. And so, you know, we did a lot of stuff together. And uh, anyway, sort of we followed a kind of a common path, I would say, in a certain sense, although he's done a lot more than I have in the last few years. Um, so I'm kind of catching up uh, with, uh, with him. He knows a lot of people in Washington and in New York and, you know, in India and in, uh, you know, a lot of places. So uh, uh, I just came here to Georgia again at the end of August and uh, we started talking and I'm here for a while. And so we thought that it might be great for us to launch a kind of a, a program or something in English in which we would feature uh, people who are specialists in the various fields and uh, bring them to the Georgian population, but also share a lot of things about South, South Caucasus with you know, English speakers. And I think you know, we can pull a pretty huge audience. Uh, and you know, we have so many things to talk about that every time we talk, we get this long <laughs> list of people you know, that we're interested in. So uh, it, you know, it's exciting, it's just kind of technically challenging uh, for us to figure out exactly, you know, how to do it during this pandemic. And, you know, so that's kind of where we are, yes, I think. Uh, absolutely. Thanks to Julie for uh, introducing me in such a great fashion. I would like to say that uh, uh, Julie and her husband, Toby, have been, have been my uh, mentors and uh, they have given me a, a lot of chances to actually go to university and, um, and and not just to university actually I worked for Julie when we were doing the work for the Georgian language and, and um, uh, grammar and all kinds of things some very interesting projects that were at the George Mason in 1990 and I was very lucky to be there between 1994 and 1997 because 
And that happened thanks to Julie, and Julie was the one who introduced me to that school. And uh, But at the same time, in 1995, and that's when I started my close relationship to Gandhiji, uh, Mr. Rajmahan Gandhi came to teach for um, one semester at the George Mason University, at the Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at the George Mason University. And uh, I got fascinated again by the figure of Gandhi. Of course, we knew a lot about that before in the former Soviet Union because the whole dissolution of the Soviet Empire happened uh, largely because of Gandhi's example. And not many people talk about it right now, but uh, the leaders of the National Liberation Movement in Georgia, they carried Gandhi's books in their pockets while they went to prison. And when they declared the national disobedience and civil disobedience campaigns and nonviolent uh, campaigns, they will always say there are two roads. And those two roads are the violent road of the guerrillas, um, like South American guerrillas or others, or the road of the great soul Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, I knew that from them. But because there were not many translations of Gandhi, his writings into Georgia, and there was only one small book translated by the 1980s, and there was Attenborough's film, which we had seen, but it was not much more to read in our languages, and so basically, when I got to the United States, and when I got acquainted with, with Rajmohan Gandhi, then I started to read uh, real Gandhi in, 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 in English language, and then I thought of uh, I should definitely dedicate my life to this cause. So um, this was really, really incredible. And then we started to work on peace building projects in the Caucasus, in the South Caucasus. And that continued on, for it continues on actually from 1997 till today. So there were many projects and some of them were involving uh, George Mason University. Then I worked with the group uh, which was connected to Harvard University, and then other different international non-NGOs, such as International Alert and, and others. In 12, 2012, I have met Jill, and then we have invited Bill and Rajadi to come to Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. And that's when this whole journey with uh, Gandhi and uh, uh, work in Georgia and Armenia started. And of course, there were a number of nonviolent events that happened that were very basically, basically, I mean, uh, guided by philosophy of Gandhiji. This was the first uh, Soviet dissolution that happened in 1989 to 1991. Uh, and it started in Georgia. Georgia was the first catalyst of this. And then it continued on in Lithuania. Latvia, Estonia, and then other countries and Soviet Union peacefully dissolved, yes? And then, of course, there was this famous Rose Revolution where, where I was involved as a member of Civic Disobedience Committee. And we actually published uh, Gandhiji's work, uh, Satyagraha Ashram Rules, and his, uh, uh, his story, My Experiments with Truth, and this became a kind of a Bible for the Rose Revolution people. And uh, this was a nonviolent uh, Rose Revolution, which was led by my friend uh, Zurab Zwania, who is not alive anymore. He was the prime minister of Georgia, who um, um, died uh, in 2005. And then, of course, when we started to work with Jill and Rajaji, the trainings went on and on and on. And we founded also the organization in Armenia, which our wonderful friend Arsen Haradian is leading, and Arsen is a is a, a very instrumental, a really great guy, our friend, who is right now based in the United States, and uh, he was one of the key figures in Armenian Velvet Revolution that took place two and a half years ago in Armenia, which was a brilliant example, another brilliant example of the Gandhian nonviolent social change, um, and. Uh, and now uh, we have continued on our work uh, together with uh, Rajagopal Ji and Jim G. And we work hard on uh, bringing a peaceful solution to the, to the problems in, the, in South Caucasus. Unfortunately, as you know, right now we have a difficult condition 
which is not just uh, spreading and uh, big scope of the pandemics. And right now, Georgia is uh, at one of the first places in, in this regard in the world. But at the same time, we have the situation of the military conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia in Nagorno-Karabakh, where we have some very unfortunate things going on because uh, um, right now we have seen the involvement of the foreign fighters, not just Armenian and Azerbaijani fighters, which in and of itself is a big uh, tragedy, but also foreign uh, mercenaries brought in from Syria who have committed atrocities in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. So right now, we definitely also need to highlight uh, the, the point of South Caucasus because Georgia is right here and Armenia and Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh is very close to Georgia. And the situation is tragic, truly tragic. And we really definitely need the Gandhian spirit of non-violence and uh, um, peace building, unfortunately. And right now, we are seeing the a very tragic situation at the uh, Karabakh conflict, and more than uh, 4,000 people have died. At least um, that is declared number from the both sides. From both sides, more than 4,000, under 5,000 is declared. But, but uh, fortunately, the the numbers might be quite higher. And on a daily basis now, the ceasefire is not necessarily holding very well, and so we. We need to work hard to achieve a peace ceasefire and then to achieve a positive peace to say in Kaltungi in terms to have a positive peace in the region because the situation is quite uh, explosive and it's very, very difficult. So that's why uh, we decided and I would, would like to thank Julie very much. So she, she just decided to help me and uh, she decided to help the region with this, with her wisdom and uh, her experiences, what I value in Julie's experiences, which uh, she talked a little bit about, but I would kind of reiterate this, that she has an experience of 1960s and 70s, which is very important, uh, uh, peace movements that were successful at that time in the United States and around the world. And right now we need this kind of spirit, we need the wisdom of those years, as well as the Gandhian wisdom to somehow bring uh, the peace camp uh, to its feet, basically, and to basically make it stronger, because that's what we definitely need in the whole area, starting from Georgia and going to Armenia and Azerbaijan, because we are facing these tragedies and we need to, we need to stop them. actually talk to people when they're just so bombarded by the amount of violence that they see on a day-to-day -day basis how do you talk about peace and violence and you know balance that with with conflict resolution let me just say, i mean iraq is going to answer that better than i can but i just want to add a few things here um you know, one of the things that uh, one of my friends and colleagues, Susan Allen, is in, in ICAR now, is in the or SCAR, or whatever, the school, and she's working, she's been working in the Caucasus and conflict with uh, first the Georgians and the uh, and Abkhaz and then Ossetians. And uh, I've seen her bring people together um, in a lot of these talks. They usually have to take them out of the country, away from there, you know, in a new setting. Um, the other thing that's really problematic here is, is that Russia is playing such a huge role in this whole thing. And if you don't have Russia at the table, I mean, you can have the Georgians and the Abkhaz or the Georgians and the Ossetians talk as much as you want. But if you have somebody, you know, kind of seeding conflict from outside, it really is complicated. You know, I was just thinking about Gandhi in a way and that, you know, it was a nonviolent um, movement on his part, but it was a liber it was a liberation movement. It was a fairly national liberation movement. Now, on the other hand, there were different peoples, you know, so it wasn't just one one nation. I mean, it wasn't one nationality, right? But <clears throat> that's easier, I think. Here it's very complicated because you've got these various peoples. You look at Nagorno-Karabakh, where both sides, Azerbaijan and Armenia, both claim this as, you know. 
their old ancient territory the same way as you have in the Middle East, you know, with Israel and Palestinians. And, and then you have other big powers, which we're now we're very worried about, Turkey, Russia, you know, um, involved in this. And then you have the United States and France backing off, you know, and how, how are people going to talk to each other? I think one of the things about uh, the school at George Mason I like is, is that people are trying and writing books and trying to talk about what might work and how you could organize it and, and what kinds of questions do you ask and how much can you push people or you know, we used to talk a lot about having children's camps. If you have children from various, you know, groups that are at, at war, but if the children can grow up together with each other without their parents, you know, maybe we could do something with that. So I think we have to think creatively, you know, because our, our goal is peace. We don't want anybody fighting. We want to stop the fighting. But on the other hand, when you do that, there are other people who may take great advantage of the peaceful people, right? Yeah. In our struggles that we had, uh, and in my experience, the three nonviolent revolutions, living through those, uh, it's always very, very difficult to deal with the, uh, the multiplicity and multitude of uh, actors and people who are involved in the process of social change or any kind of change without them touching upon the subject of violence. And of course, the majority of them are predisposed by the propaganda and by the discourse in which, in which they are existing to say that the violent, violent way is the only way out. And unfortunately, we do have a number one problem that I see in contemporary world and especially in contemporary South Caucasus. Um, is that there is so much militaristic and via pro-violence propaganda going on on TV or in all kinds of entertainment shows. And uh, there is a culture of violence created. And what happens is that uh, this is a rhetoric that people learn from TV uh, and from social networks and other media outlets. And right now, majority of the media outlets unfortunately, are operating on the assumption, which is like, oh, someone needs to come in with the with arms and stop this. And uh, like uh, in many cases, they really do not talk about the nonviolent education concept. Because our children, they watch TV much more than they go to school. And they are being educated by that. And, and being kind of familiar with the uh, with, with, uh, concepts and the work and the practice of the nonviolent education, education without a violence, and nonviolent culture, and nonviolent economy. This is so important. And uh, learning how ahimsa can work. Because we are the students all our lives. And we learn ahimsa all our lives how to be nonviolent. Because in some situations, human being can be very nonviolent, but in other situations, they might fall to rage, and it might happen to all of us, even during the time when I was protesting the violent regimes. And people need to learn that constantly. And what is the great help to them in this process is uh, to have at least one or two shows who, that gives them the outlet. Of course, we do have a number of wonderful uh, internet outlets. One of them is a Jagadat which is a Gandhian outlet. And uh, there are some others teaching about nonviolence. And, uh, but the problem is that in the, like today's world, the analytical talk shows, for instance, if you watch the analytical talk shows on CNN and Fox and BBC and others, I mean, more or less, more or less, but more or less, they're all pro-militaristic, unfortunately, because the establishment today demands that military industrial complex needs to collect the money. And then if, if we are not militaristic, that the money will not come for advertisements, etc. All of that is connected to each other. Today, what we see in South Africa is the military industrial complex is doing its job very well. But the peace people, people who are for peace and our complex, whatever we call it, we don't have, unfortunately, 
as much, of course, we don't have. We will never have as much money as they have. We don't have as much resources, but even in terms of human contribution, it's very risky. It has become very risky for people to talk, talk about positivity, talk about ahimsa, talk about how to have, uh, how to abolish not just direct violence, but also structural violence, or cultural violence, all kinds of things, and patriarchy. All of those things, these are kind of taboo subjects. And they are not touched upon uh, in uh, mainstream uh, media. Of course, still the peace discourse is on the fringes. And one of the main, uh, main uh, goals for all of us, I think it should be to bring more and more of the talks, um, more and more of the, uh, of the discourse in the show, more of the narratives that bring the peace narrative instead of a uh, war and violence narrative. Or bring the Ahimsa narrative, bring the Swaraj, Swadeshi, and others. And Jai Jagat is also very important because Jai Jagat is long live the world. But now is the time for us to pick up this message and uh, go forward. And I would be very encouraged to uh, do this together with the artists and scientists and uh, people who were an activist who work for these issues, who do create something. Julie has done it, George Mason, and lots of our friends have done it around the world. Together with the specialists of conflict resolution and peace studies and Dandian studies and people like Raja Gopal and Jill, who have done a great job to this country and actually to Armenia. Raja Gopal uh, trained Armenian prime minister in non-violent uh, walks and he's talking about the salt march and the Armenian revolution two years ago happened with the march. It was the adequate to the salt march. Uh, Nikol Pachinian, the prime minister of Armenia, who is now in a horrible situation, I should say, because he's under attack from four countries, I guess, a big empire like uh, Russia and uh, Turkey and uh, Azerbaijan, of course, and uh, I don't know who is next, but you know, it's probably France and the United States, and India actually is also having morally peaceful position in this situation. But other countries are there. But Nicole was brilliant in doing the nonviolent Velvet Revolution. And after a meeting with Rajaji, and he developed this, and he was brilliant. He walked for kilometers, 500 kilometer walk. He did to Yerevan, and then he came to Yerevan, and I was there. And he came there, and uh, Arsene and I were standing there, and Arsene was telling me that Nicole is walking to Yerevan, and lots of people were just smiling and saying, like, so what's the deal? He's walking. He walked to Yerevan, and in Yerevan, 300,000 people came out and actually asked for political change, and they received what they asked for, because uh, then Prime Minister, former Prime Minister, Sir Sarfissian said, it was uh, probably one of the most amazing things that I have seen for my entire life, even though I myself was involved in two of those Georgian revolutions. But in Armenia, it happened absolutely peacefully. But that, and the prime minister said, if 300,000 people, my compatriots, asked me to resign, I need to resign. With no problem, he didn't even put up any kind of resistance, he resigned, and then the Nicole Pachinian has formed a new government. So this was brilliant. And this was a direct contribution from Raja Gopal G and Jill G and uh, Ambassador Ashok Sajankar and our, our friends who went to Yerevan and uh, helped our center found the um, um, Foundation Armenia, it was founded in 2015. And uh, one of the first offices that we went to was uh, the office of uh, now Prime Minister Nicole Pachinian. And it was a small room, just like this, where I'm sitting right now. Actually, I'm sitting right now in a bigger room than he was. His party was, the whole party had that time in 2015. In 2018, he did this heroic act. He just walked there a full of kilometers, and then uh, the peaceful Velvet Revolution happened. But now the situation is quite critical. Right now we face a direct violence and a threat of cataclysm and catastrophe in South Caucasus as well as around. 
and big empires. The Turkey is asserting their power very aggressively, and Russia is there. All these big countries are messing their heads, and uh, thousands of people are dying and beheaded. We need to help. We need to somehow stop these atrocities. And for that, spirit of Gandhiji is the strongest spirit. And we need all to unite because we do have uh, lots of different experiences. And uh, I thank you all of them for participating in this. And uh, we really need to have more and more efforts to stop the violence, not just in Kabul, but around the world. What concrete plans do you have for your program and what would you like, what, what are your, your hopes and dreams for this program um, at the end? <laughs> Julie, would you like to start or you want me to? I'll just say a few start? things because, you know, actually Irakli is the leader here in this, I mean, I'm just catching up a little bit, but um, regarding English, of course, in Georgia, there are so many people who speak English or who understand English and maybe not perfectly uh, you know, lots of issues, but I think that we can reach uh, a Georgian audience um, in an English program. And then it also would reach uh, broadly, more broadly. So I think that's kind of the idea is to bring uh, English specialists, in, you know, or somebody English speakers in for them, and then also uh, share the Georgian stuff. But I mean, it may be harder for us to find some of the Georgians that we would like to share whose English is good enough uh, you know, to, to maintain um, in the program. Uh, so uh, I think we think our idea is sharing. Now, part of my role will be, um, I think, because I really know film and uh, art better. Uh, and I do think that film is one of the ways that we can widen the, um, what I can I say, our base, that we can increase our base is by, you know, sometimes films will speak to people who might not otherwise agree or who might be touched by some way by the story. I mean, stories mean a lot. So I think we need to bring some of those stories or, or, or those who share them. And, and uh, many of those can be shared. I mean, they have subtitles and we could lead to them or have people talk about them. That might be one thing that we can do in this program. Um, we can, uh, also talk to have specialists come in and maybe run some sessions or something. And I think to, in part, it may kind of go little by little. Um, again, I'll let Adirak speak, but I think as we go, we get other ideas or people kind of come in and then it will take, it will take, you know, its own kind of uh, movement forward too. Yes, uh, I think we are, uh, we are listening actually. One of the things is that, that we are listening on the traditions of nonviolence and peace on violence and peace in, uh, in the area and uh, in the Caucasus at large. And we have lots of great traditions here. So we have lots of uh, places for Mark to listen, but also we would like to talk about the situation in South Africa from the lens of the Gandhian, uh, from the Gandhian lens and from the lens of conflict revolution and bring a non-militaristic discourse to the action. And in this case, creativity, empathy, and nonviolence, as Dalton says, helps because we need the creative language to overcome the, overcome the barriers of the, of the discourse that the militaristic discourse have created. And uh, of course, this is a huge task, but we are trying to do a little bit. We are not trying to do so much. And uh, uh, thanks to Julie that she says that uh, uh, she gives all kinds of compliments to me. And I really, 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 really appreciate that. But I really, really hope that both of us will be, we are working on a really equal basis because she brings her own experience, very, very valuable experience of being in the United States during the civil rights movement, which is one of the greatest achievements of the nonviolent movements around the world. And uh, after that, only after that, there was uh, what followed also under the inspiration of Gandhiji was the, the, the transformation of the Soviet Union into the different republics, a peaceful transformation, followed with many, many problems. But at the same time, we see right now the nonviolent revolution. That is the way to go. Thank you for listening. 
We hope that you found some inspirations and insights for your own work in promoting peace and nonviolence. Even when the challenges seem vast and complex, involving long history and multiple countries, there's always something each of us can do. Speaking Our Peace is produced by Annie Luck, Ashima Vishnoi, Priya Joshi, and Reva Joshi. You can reach out to us at speakingourpeace at gmail.com. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram at Our Peace Podcast. We are supported by the International Gandhian Institute for Nonviolence and Peace Canada, the Mohammed Gandhi Canadian Foundation for World Peace, and Jai Jagat 2020. Our music is made by Sunbear. See you next time.